I uh, wanted to welcome everybody to Window into COP24 live from Katowice, Poland. Um, thanks for joining us to get an inside look at this really awesome historic event and hear from our Minnesota delegate, Jesse Turk. Um, I wanted to take a moment just to introduce myself. Um, my name is Lauren Baritsky. I'm the communications coordinator here at Climate Generation, a Will Speaker Legacy. Um, and we are a nonprofit in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, and we are the facilitators of the Window into COP24 program, um, which has sent four Minnesota business delegates over to COP24 this year. Um, and so just to give a background on who we are, um, Climate Generation was founded in 2006 by polar explorer Will Steger. And um, really he had an incredible eyewitness to climate change as he did his expeditions in the polar regions. Um, and that's really fueled our work that we do here in Minnesota and beyond. Uh, Will is truly a man that knows no limits and that power of the human spirit um, and human de determination is something that we carry through um, in all of the work we do and also something that we acknowledge we need in COP24 as we know that climate change action is urgent and necessary. So our mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. And through this work, um, we work with many audiences, youth, educators, the public, and influentials on building climate literacy, developing powerful advocates, um, and elevating the leadership um, of the people that we work with. And so really it's engagement and action on um, different scales. And Climate Generation has been sending delegations to COPs. Um, for several years. So we are an accredited uh, nonprofit that can send delegations to these conferences. And so the first time we sent a delegation was in 2009 with uh, COP15, which was in Copenhagen. And back then we were known as the Will Speaker Foundation, which you can see on the upper left there in that photo. And um, the next big delegation that we sent after that was in COP um, was for COP uh, 15 in Paris, or sorry, COP 21 in Paris in 2015, um, which we sent a delegation of 10 teachers from across the nation to act as critical mes messengers of climate change and energy literacy because they interact with hundreds of students each year. Um, then in 2017 for COP 23, we sent a delegation of multi-sector uh, leaders, whether it be youth in their schools um, or policymakers or people from the philanthropy industry, indigenous leaders. Um, we recognize that all voices must be represented at the table um, and allowed to make decisions. And so we sent that delegation after the United States um, had vowed to pull out of the Paris Agreement. And so this year, we're really excited to send a delegation of four business leaders. And as we think about this COP, um, there are three key things that we really want people to know about why climate generation um, is invested in this work. And so to start, COP24 is the 24th annual conference to assess um, the progress on climate action and to make decisions on global climate action. And so really this COP itself, COP24, is focusing on the Paris Agreement. And um, the Paris Agreement was kind of birthed in 2015 at Paris COP21. Um, and it's the first framework for setting, assessing, and ratcheting up greenhouse gas reduction goals um, across the world per country. And so why are United States businesses an important presence at COP24 this year? Well, um, the private sector is really continuing the strong leadership and commitments to um, our Paris Agreement pledges as a country. Um, the Trump administration did promise to remove the United States from the Paris Agreement, um, but many people don't know that this actually won't happen until November of 2020, which is two days after the election. Um, and so we're not completely out of it yet. Um, but the businesses that we are sending um, are representing Minnesota leadership, and um, Minnesota is a member of the U.S. Climate Alliance, as well as the We Are Still In initiative, which I'm sure you'll hear Jesse talk about a little bit in today's webinar. Um, and so we have a lot of strong renewable energy goals statewide, and we're committed to the Paris Agreement. Um, and when we think about COP24, I think it's really important to get grounded in what Patricia Espinoza, who is the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, um, 
She said that COP21 saw the birth of the Paris Agreement um, in Poland this year, as many are calling it, Paris 2.0. Um, we will put together the pieces, directions, and guidelines in order to make the framework really operate. So countries this year are uh, creating the rule book for how to implement the Paris Agreement, how to communicate um, the different uh, goals that they are creating. So as we move into our host for this webinar today, um, I wanted to introduce Jesse Turk, who is an architect and project manager at BWBR. And he's the longest running member of BWBR's performance design group and tracks and reports building energy data for the AIA 2030 commitment. He lives in an energy efficient remodeled home in St. Paul with his wife and three kids. And just to remind you, before I turn it over to Jesse, if you have any questions during today's webinar, please feel free to type them in the chat or Q&A boxes, and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. Um, but all right, I will turn it over to Jesse. I'll stop my screen share and he can get started. The basics of why do we care? And, uh, for me, it's, it's pretty simple. <clears throat> uh, it's the earth. It, it's our home. And uh, climate change is real and it's happening now and you can see it in just about everywhere you look and uh, there is no planet b so we can't screw up the one that we have because um, there's nowhere else to go and you've probably seen uh, graphs similar to this um, showing the co2 concentration uh, over the last 2000 years and how it spikes at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And then on the right hand side, you can see how that correlates to temperature. And as the CO2 goes up, so does the temperature. And then just zooming in a little closer to the Industrial Revolution since 1880, you can see how the, the actual temperature has jumped. And you can see the 2015 to 2016 had a pretty significant jump. 2017 uh, wasn't as warm, uh, but 2018 is warming as well. Um, so I guess the other question is, you know, why why an architect? Why why does that uh, why does that matter to me? And uh, 10 years ago or a little more, uh, the Architecture 2030 organization came out with information showing that buildings account for a huge amount of the CO2 emissions. And recently, they updated their stats here that globally buildings account for roughly 40% of the carbon emissions, which is a huge amount. So we, uh, we can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. So to be part of the solution, they came up with a goal of uh, setting increasingly difficult or stringent goals every five years to reduce building energy use. Um, so right now we're at a 70% energy use reduction target. And then by 2030, the goal is to be operating carbon neutral uh, with getting the electricity just from renewables. And the American Institute of Architects is also on board with that, um, stating that we have a, a vital role in that effort. Um, as Lauren mentioned, the Paris Agreement in 2015 was a, a huge step forward for the planet. Um, some very key items were agreed to, um, but uh, they're getting fleshed out more and more every year. And what does COP stand for? It's the Conference of the Parties. So essentially every, every country in the world is a party. Um, and it's under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCC, which these are just a couple of the many acronyms I've been seeing over here. And then, as Lauren mentioned, um, the, our president uh, announced a, a little over a year ago that he was intending to pull us out of the Paris Agreement, which uh, is very unfortunate. Um, but I think one of the great things that the negotiators in Paris did was set the withdrawal time frame for four years out, just in case the uh, um, election was uh, someone who was a climate denier was elected. Um, so hopefully we've got a, a chance to get back in with a, a new election. And then just a, a little bit of information of uh, the number of countries that are in. Uh, this was in early last year. 
showing that there's three countries in the world that either didn't sign on or announced that they were withdrawing. Um, and Nicaragua and Syria are not countries that we're typically um, lumped in with globally when we're talking about uh, just about anything. And then a little while later, uh, Nicaragua and then Syria uh, joined. So now we are the only country in the world who's uh, not officially uh, signed on to the agreement. But as Lauren mentioned, there's a We Are Still In initiative um, that uh, here's just some stats of uh, who's all signed up for it. And it's approaching half of the population of the country that are represented there in all the 50 states and approaching $10 trillion in GDP, which if that was a country, it would be the third largest in the world. So um, that is one, one bright spot that uh, we're seeing over here. Just, uh, I think people from other countries are realizing that um, although the leadership in Washington doesn't support it, but the states and local governments and businesses are definitely on board with the Paris targets as well as Minnesota. We're one of the several states that are signed on to the We Are Still In campaign. And Climate Generation had an event uh, this last summer when it was officially announced that the state would be part of, part of the group um, with uh, our governor and Will Steger and Nicole Rahm, the executive director of Climate Generation there um, for that event. And then it was also a, a well-attended event by a number of business leaders with uh, all of us stating what our individual companies are doing that are on the, the large poster that you see in the foreground. So that brings me to COP24 here in Katowice. This is um, part of their promotional imagery. And uh, Katowice is an interesting choice. Um, I, I heard it described earlier this year that Sometimes they pick the locations based on, uh, we'll say more of a the problem child of the group. Um, Katowice is a, still is a very industrial town. Um, the actual site where the negotiations are happening is a former coal mine. Uh, the large structure you see in the, <clears throat> in the middle there is actually part of the former mining operation. Uh, so they redeveloped this part of, which is now essentially in the middle of their town. Um, on a former industrial site. And then here's a picture of a banner that they had <clears throat> just showing on the, the left, the former, um, former view of that, and then on the right when it's been redeveloped. Um, <clears throat> and as I mentioned, this is a coal mining and steel production part of the country. And uh, so it's been redeveloped, but it's still actively uh, burning coal in Poland. I think they get around 80% of their electricity from coal. And the week before the conference started, Katowice was named the second worst air quality in all of Europe. And uh, when you step off the train or the bus, you can definitely smell the, um, I think it's sulfur dioxide or some other chemical that's not, uh, not pleasant to breathe. <clears throat> And I guess, again, the uh, uh, greenhouse gases uh, went up last year, which um, was disappointing, but uh, I heard a few people talking today that it's, um, you know, it's an early bump in the road, hopefully, and the, the emissions will uh, level off and hopefully start decreasing rapidly soon. So uh, just a little geography lesson. Um, so this is our planet, again, the red line is approximately my uh, flight path for the three flights in 13 hours, um, seven time zones ahead. A uh, little European geography, that's Poland. Uh, zooming in, this is uh, roughly the, the region that we're in. <clears throat> and so I flew into Krakow and am staying in Oswinchem. And then the, the conference is in Katowice. So there's uh, buses and trains that are essentially running uh, throughout the whole region that um, participants in the negotiations can ride for free. Um, so it's about an hour one-way trip 
um, for me, and it's about an hour and a half or so from the folks that are staying in Krakow. So this was uh, the scene when I got off the train the first, first day in town, um, and the World Wildlife Fund has been projecting uh, images on the glass of the train station uh, showing that we're an endangered species and they were cycling through in several different languages. Um, you'll also notice the police vehicle there, which it was the same day that the climate march was. Um, the march was over, but there was still uh, limited protesting going on. And there was literally thousands of police in the street. Um, and this vehicle was one of about 10 in a row that was just driving up and down the street, um, just uh, essentially uh, doing security. And then here's another view of the police vehicles just parked and waiting. Um, and then Santa was also supervising the event um, just to make sure the people were on the nice list and not the naughty list. Um, another view of the, the protest, uh, and you can see that there's a few protest signs on the left side of the screen, but pretty much the entire picture is police and that was a fairly accurate description or showing of uh, just the number of police versus um, protesters and other observers. And uh, everyone was very peaceful and civil and you know, more uh, chanting and singing than anything. And it was uh, by early evening, it had uh, dispersed quite a bit. And the, the event center is in the, the background there. You can see with the, the large banners on it. And then as you get closer, you can see the the signage and the flags from all the representative countries. And then just a close up view of the, the flags that night. Uh, and then Sunday was a, officially an off day, um, other than the highest level negotiators were still working, but everyone else was uh, off. So uh, myself and two of the other delegates uh, from Climate Generation attended the Sustainable Innovation Forum, which was a official side event um, for different uh, business leaders and businesses from around the world, uh, which was a really great event. And we'll show you some of the, some of the things we saw and uh, different uh, companies that were there. And so they had four key streams of topics um, broken down, as you can see, from circular economy, sustainable mobility, energy transition, climate finance, and then they had a kickoff event by the, the president of COP24. And one of the things that he said that stuck out at me was the, that there is hope and opportunity and the, the, the world is moving so fast that it's only a matter of which opportunity to grasp. So lots of opportunity, we just have to keep moving forward. And then uh, Dr. Bertrand Picard, um, he was one of the people from the Solar Impulse Foundation, with a picture in the upper right of the solar powered plane that flew around the world um, two or three years ago, something like that. Um, and he talked about how just the CO2 is a marker of inefficiency and countries and companies that have addressed the cost of carbon in their work um, by paying a real value of what the carbon costs have almost universally increase their profits um, just because they're focusing on the carbon as a waste and become much more efficient and more profitable doing it. And then um, I'll uh, let you guys uh, read the name of the Minister for the Environment and Natural Resources in Iceland. Um, but uh, one of the things he talked about being an island nation, that fishing is very important to them, um, but that there'll be more in 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So this panel uh, talked a lot about just water quality and plastics in the ocean, uh, microplastics and different, um, different ways to try and keep the plastic out of the water, but also when it is there, uh, try and remove it and clean the water as much as possible. Um, and then the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority gave a Sort of an opening event and a couple other uh, speaking things. Um, 
they're talking about the Mohammed bin Rashid solar park, which when it's completed in, I think it's 2020 or 2025, uh, will be the largest single location for solar in the world at 5,000 megawatts, which is just a almost incomprehensible scale. You can see the, the model there of um, how, how big it is. And they're, uh, they're doing a lot of other things in their uh, energy sector, but it, uh, there were several of us discussing that it, uh, it, there's probably a fair amount of greenwashing in their promotional material as well. Um, and now I'll just go through a few of the, com the companies that were there. Um, Understory is an, a relatively new startup company, which uh, based out of Madison, Wisconsin, which was kind of surprising. Um, but they're able to have uh, weather stations that they put around cities that can do up to or down to a 50 meter grid and analyze wind speed and pollution um, and a bunch of other uh, categories that they can collect from their sensors. Um, and what they can do in real time, they can show different concentrations of pollutants in the air and do things to address that. So they're working with Dallas now. And one thing that they're trying is uh, they can adjust the rates of the toll ways. Um, so maybe it's cheaper to drive in to work earlier. So then you're, you're not having as many cars idling on the road and thus reducing the unhealthy pollution associated with it. So um, this was actually the, the rollout for this software. So they're um, looking for other cities to do it in. Uh, Blue Water is a company that was on the, the water and plastic uh, panel talking about just trying to reduce the single use water bottle and the just amazing stats of how many water bottles are made every day and the small percentage that are recycled. Um, so essentially this is a reverse osmosis machine that you can buy and place at your business or pretty much anywhere you want it that you can uh, then generate uh, clean water because the in a lot of places the perception is well the tap water isn't clean so you buy water bottles and then uh, it just is a self-perpetuating cycle that there's more water bottles and then you drink more water from water bottles and where this is a, a nice self-contained unit that you can use reusable water bottles. <clears throat> Um, and then the, the Great Bubble Barrier, which is a fun name, interesting product that they essentially have um, a, a, a tube with holes in it that they put at the bottom of a river that the bubbles go up in a line. And as the plastics go through the water, the bubbles push them to the surface and then direct them to the the side of the, the river bank or stream bank, and then they have catchment pieces that they can then collect the plastic from the river. Um, so it, you know, you would do it downstream from a city or something like that. So you don't you catch the plastic at the source, so it doesn't have a chance to go further down and uh, degrade into smaller and smaller particles, which are harder to harder to remove and more detrimental to fish and other wildlife. Um, and then BSR is a, a sustainable uh, investment and consulting company, um, but the president was talking about it. And the one stat that was amazing to me, we've been hearing a lot about wildfires in California the last few months, but that 13 of the 20 most damaging fires in California were in the last 14 months, which is just a mind blowing statistic. And don't foresee it getting any better. Um, and then climate coin, uh, this is, there's a lot of discussion on blockchain, um, which is the same uh, backbone that like Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies are based on, which I am by far not an expert in. Um, but essentially what they're trying to do is be a way to connect uh, people or businesses that are trying to offset their carbon emissions directly with 
um, the people that are doing projects to sequester the carbon. So these guys gave an example of uh, they're working with uh, groups in the Amazon that you can invest in and they have you know, a direct connection to the folks on the ground that are uh, making sure that the forests aren't clear cut and that kind of thing. And then with the, the money that the, the locals on the ground are getting, they're able to you know, obviously spend that on things that they need that then they won't have to clear cut the forest and um, that kind of thing. So it, um, it's interesting. I think we'll be hearing a lot more of this. Um, there's one guy who was talking about business cycles and that it's typically a six year cycle and we're about two years into the climate or into the blockchain cycle. So in the next four years, he's thinking it'll, you know, the bugs will be worked out and the next business cycle, it'll become just extremely mainstream. Um, and then this was uh, Aton. Um, it's an interesting uh, waste to energy product that uh, essentially they can take almost anything as an input and once they need about 20 minutes of energy to get the, the system heated up that it's essentially a giant microwave that can melt just about anything and then in the, I think it's in the green tanks in the foreground, the gases are then uh, reburned. So it's essentially splitting all the waste down to the atomic level. And then um, out the other end comes electricity and heat. And then just um, the harmless, um, harmless byproducts. So like one example, they're working with uh, folks in the Gulf to clean up the BP oil spill where they dump sand in on one side, it burns up the oil, and then you get uh, sand and uh, non-reactive uh, carbon out on the other end. Um, and they actually can break down any sort of hazardous waste, including asbestos, which I found quite amazing, especially in the, the building sector where oftentimes we have a significant abatement that just will end up being landfilled somewhere. Um, and then the, the Siki Sui House, uh, it's a company out of Japan that does um, mass customization of houses that uh, they're really jumping into um, zero energy and how they're doing lots of them and for just slightly above market pricing. Um, and it was uh, some pretty interesting stuff they're doing. Um, BMW is one of the sponsors of the event and uh, somehow we're able to get their new electric vehicle into the lobby of the hotel. So a um, pretty, pretty fun little uh, electric car. Um, and then this morning I went to the, the country or organization pavilions, which is part of inside the top secure perimeter, uh, I guess we'll say. Um, so this is where typically countries will have a pavilion promoting um, the sustainable activities that they're, they're doing. Um, there's also uh, like large NGOs will have pavilions as well. Um, for the second year now, the US does not have an official, um, official pavilion. Um, they were, they did take over the World Wildlife Fund's pavilion for four days. Um, <clears throat> so today was the last day of that. So I wanted to make sure we got there to see it before it uh, reverted back to the World Wildlife Fund. <clears throat> um, so uh, just some, some pictures of uh, the inside with, this was uh, kind of a business lounge area that was uh, between some of the larger pavilions. And you can see that essentially these are all temporary buildings that they put up on the convention center grounds um, that will be there for the duration and then they'll be taken down and um, moved somewhere else. Um, so this was the, the Nordic cooperation. So the, the Nordic countries uh, partnered uh, for this, and then they had another booth kind of across the hall. Uh, this was India's um, with 
lots of stats of uh, their renewable energy installations and um, just more stuff about the country. Um, <clears throat> so the uh, Pacific Island Pavilion um, with lots of plants and um, uh, wood from their country. And then Thailand had a, a kind of a really cool one with um, almost a jungle-like feel with all the plants hanging down. And then they're, again, they were talking about their different initiatives of how they're uh, taking the waste products from the cassava production and turning that into useful, uh, useful products. And then here's the, the US Climate Action Center. Um, just a, a view from the outside for the, the briefing room. And then a, another view on the inside. Um, and then the, the one panel that we sat in for was the what's next for Paris. Um, Sue Finiaz, I think is something like that anyways. Uh, she was a former lead climate lawyer and negotiator for the US and then Todd Stern, who was the uh, special envoy for climate change that were um, both very involved in Paris. Um, but uh, at the beginning, Todd joked that uh, the pavilion this year was the uh, old negotiator's home, um, just because they are not uh, officially involved in the negotiations. There's other folks from the US. Um, but they just went through, you know, obviously what's changed since the Paris Agreement. Um, and then the, the challenges that the negotiators are facing this year being the first year that it's uh, essentially setting the rules and how it's a uh, Paris is essentially non uh, non binding. So each country, the countries can't be forced to do things that they don't want to do. Um, and just trying to get the logistics of, you know, measuring the same things. Um, and that kind of thing. And then just the complexity of the specific negotiations, as you can imagine, there's lots of um, ins and outs that the different levels of negotiators don't know all of it. And especially the, um, the higher level folks don't, um, don't know all the specifics that the, the negotiators on the ground that have been you know, meeting on this for years um, and just how that translates as they're trying to get to an agreement um, on the rule book is very challenging. Um, I don't know how much this has been in the news yet. Um, I assume it's maybe been in a little bit. Uh, I know I saw something about it ahead of time, but the U.S. Innovative Technologies for Economic Dynamism, which is a really uh, odd mouthful of words, um, but essentially this was, this is the only official US uh, event here. Um, and they're, they were promoting the virtues of fossil fuels. Um, so as when it was announced, Michael Bloomberg uh, had a quote of how promoting fossil fuels at the COP was kind of like uh, promoting smoking at a cancer convention. It just doesn't really seem to fit. Um, so the picture on the left is the lineup of people inside um, the uh, ante room ahead of the room. And then the picture on the right was the line wrapping out of the room all the way down the hall. Um, and this was uh, close to an hour before the event actually started. So there was definitely a buzz about it and a lot of people wanted to get in and see. Um, so shortly after it started, uh, there was about 100 people that stood up and uh, started chanting, keep it in the ground. And then uh, after several minutes, they, uh, I don't know if they left on their own or were escorted out, but were uh, yelling shame on you or something like that. Um, it'll likely be on the news there tonight, I would guess. Um, and then just from the, the one article I found, um, just uh, how after that, the, uh, U.S. Uh, folks were continuing to promote fracking and, you know, that we shouldn't be that alarmed about climate change. Um, 
and then just uh, another interesting side note that investors have started to uh, push back on uh, governments to reduce their exposure to uh, fossil fuels and climate change. Um, and then uh, this weekend, the, the US, Russia, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait um, essentially were blocking um, key things from the, the recent intergovernmental panel on climate change. Um, and then I showed a picture of Santa earlier. Here is another Santa we saw. Um, uh, this is a, a sadder version, but uh, it uh, I think makes a good point that there is no border for our uh, carbon pollution. Um, and then I guess we'll just end on a uh, an interesting story. Um, another delegate, Alexis from Best Buy, and I were at the Sustainable Innovation Forum last night. Uh, and we were talking to a, a journalist from Bulgaria, and he's a nice guy and probably better informed on U.S. politics than at least 80% of the U.S. citizens. Um, and we were just explaining the organization and you know what we do and the founder, Will Steger, and he's like, oh, I, I, I don't know the name. And then we talked a little bit more and he said, oh, that's the guy in the red coat. I know him. And, you know, he's, he's probably 35, um, lives on the other side of the world and, you know, knew of Will and his um, exploration and uh, activities he's been doing around the world. So that was, uh, that was really cool. And then just a, a picture from last night of the, the downtown uh, area just near the, the Christmas market. So with that, uh, I think we'll open it up for questions. Thanks, Jesse. Um, yeah, so if anyone has questions for our q and I invite you to type them in the Q&A box that you can find um, at the bottom of your screen and typing them in there. Um, but to get it started, um, Jesse, we have been um, joined by a uh, classroom from Minnesota. A teacher is following the COP24 experience with her students. And um, they are reading about you as one of our delegates and they have a question for you. Okay. So um, they said that they heard that you remodeled your garage and home to be more energy efficient. And they were wondering how long um, it took for that to eventually happen. Um, do you feel like you're getting paid off with saving money on making your house more energy efficient? And who came up with the plans for that remodel for your home? Um. <clears throat> Uh, it, we'll start with the easy one. Uh, yes, uh, we think we're getting a payback. Um, the solar panels on the garage went live, I think it was in October. Um, but the projections we've gotten from the solar company that it should be about a seven or eight year payback with our system and the, the program that we're in. Um, as far as uh, timing, it's taken way too long. Uh, but that was more based on the contractor selection, and we, we won't get into that on this webinar. Um, and as far as the design, um, my wife, uh, Jean, is also an architect. Uh, I believe she's also listening and watching. Um, so it's been a, a joint effort between the, the two architects in the house for the design. I think, was that all the parts of the question? I think so, yes. Okay. Great. Um, we have a question from Janet who's watching. What are the biggest challenges in designing buildings with regard to climate change? Um, I, I think uh, the biggest challenge is just um, having the owners and design teams making it a priority. Um, projects that we've done for the state of Minnesota through the B3 program, which uh, by law, state-funded buildings have to meet the energy reduction targets that I showed earlier. And we've done a, a number of those projects and we, we can meet the targets on those uh, almost without question. Um, but it's just on the other projects where we're not required to meet the targets, uh, it's not as much of a priority for uh, the design team and the owner. Um, so oftentimes it just falls by the wayside. 
Um, another question. So what um, are others in your industry also participating in at COP24? Um, are you seeing events on sustainable agri or um, uh, I was going to say agriculture, sustainable architecture? Um, and what does the presence look like there for designing sustainable cities? Um, the there was two sessions at the Sustainable Innovation Forum that dealt with uh, sustainable cities specifically. Um, and it, it was fairly high level uh, discussions. Um, but I guess other than that, I, I haven't run into any other architects um, or any other, um, I don't think I've run into anyone else in the building industry directly. Mm. Sure. Um, Amber, who is watching, is wondering if you could say more about the greenwashing that you mentioned seeing um, from businesses in other countries at COP. Um, I guess it was, uh, the one was specifically from uh, Dubai and the United Arab Emirates that um, they've announced uh, by 2050, they're going to be 75% clean energy, which uh, on the surface seems like a good thing, but it seems too far away and such a low target for a country that has uh, presumably lots of space to do renewables and uh, I assume enough money to actually make it happen. Um, and they, uh, their, their presentation was really... Um, over the top, I will say, with their promotional video that had a soundtrack that was pretty much out of the you know, your blockbuster action movie. Mm. Sure, so more dramatic than necessary, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and their uh, their interim targets, they're counting like 7% uh, coming from clean coal and 40% uh, from gas. Um, so it just, it, it didn't seem like they were uh, going far enough or for what they were doing, they were over promoting it, we'll say. Sure. Um, what about, um, oh, here we have another one that just came in. Um, so James is asking, given your experience in your profession where um, requirements usually drive action on sustainable initiatives, from your observations at the conference, can climate action be enacted without government mandates? Are you hearing businesses actually interested in change, even when governments may not be? Uh, yes, uh, there was a, a number of very innovative business models and businesses that were um, that we saw things from in the last two days at the Sustainable Innovation Forum, um, and the the. the the uh, carbon financing and uh, some of the blockchain stuff that I mentioned before was um, really interesting and I think a, a game changer as far as um, you know a way to get essentially money from developed countries to developing countries uh, to make sure that they keep their forests and um, preserve their environment that we're all relying on uh, them for the oxygen and carbon reduction. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's some contention a little bit with Poland too, um, just being, as you were saying in the beginning, being such a strong coal country. And I wonder if, because as they're the presidency of the COP, but they also have this um, very fossil fuel based economy. Can you speak to anything you're seeing there about how um, they're trying to move forward while they're, um, uh, you know, also kind of stuck in the past too. Um, I guess I haven't really seen anything uh, from the Polish government specifically. Um, I, I'm hoping to get to more events uh, in the actual COP center um, as the week goes on. But I, with it being closed yesterday and the, the forum stuff, I. I haven't gotten to spend as much time over there as I will the rest of the week. Sure. It sounds like the, the Polish president um, or the COP presidency from Poland, um, at least from the Sustainable Innovation Forum, was pretty 
um, pretty uh, stark with their comments about needing to move forward with opportunity though. So that's a positive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so let's close on one last question. So though you've only been there for just over the weekend, what is the, um, the thing or the experience that's given you the most hope so far in being at COP24 and what you're seeing? Um, I think just seeing uh, all the really smart people working towards the common goal. It, uh, um, before this, I was at an event and spent quite a bit of time talking to a, a few folks that work at the UN and just the the level of knowledge and understanding of um, diving into essentially different business sectors from all the different countries and how how they're able to track uh, carbon output and how they're able to uh, working on a, a website to essentially a searchable way to connect people around the world in different industries to learn from each other. Definitely, yeah. Um, I think that just being interconnected as we continue to work on climate change is the most important thing. So that's, I feel very reassuring. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's not going to be easy, but I, I think it's doable. Definitely. Just a quick question too. It came in just as I was speaking. Um, Simona is wondering, has anyone mentioned the drawdown project from Paul Hawken while you're over there and any of the strategies mentioned in that book? Um, not that I've heard. Um, the guy with the Solar Impulse Foundation had, oh, let me just look at my notes here quick. Uh, oh, the uh, A Thousand Solutions, it's an initiative on their website where they're um, essentially vetting a, a thousand different things from people submitting around the world of ways to reduce carbon mm. um, and it's uh, a, a, there's a, a hashtag a thousand solutions um, and it's also on their website I'll have to check that out yeah um, great is there anything that um, else that you'd like to share Jesse before I move into the closing um, I guess just uh, thanks everyone for taking some time out of your afternoon to see what I've been up to the last few days. Definitely. All right, I'll um, do a little closing here from Climate Generation. So um, we're so grateful for Jesse and all he's experiencing over there in COP um, and translating it back to us as we're following. But I encourage everybody who's watching to also tune into our digest that we have going on as part of our Window into COP24 program. Um, following our four business delegates from Best Buy, Target, BWBR, and Fig and Faro. You can find all that information at climategen.org slash COP24, and you can also follow along on our social media channels with the hashtag MNCOP24. And before you leave, I'd love for all of you to save the date. Um, we are doing webinars all this week to bring the live Poland experience to you wherever you are. Um, so on December 11th tomorrow, we have another webinar at 12 p.m. Um, Minnesota time, and that will be with the School of Environmental Studies, high school students who are over there. So they actually, um, this school that's in Minnesota sends a delegation each year, and they're one of the only high, school, um, high schools that send students to the COP, which is pretty fantastic. So we're gonna get an inside look from the youth perspective tomorrow at noon. And then on December 19th, we'll also have um, an event and it will be streamed live on YouTube um, for our post COP24 panel, which will feature um, two, if not all, of our delegates that we sent over um, to Poland, including Jesse. Jesse will be on that panel. And you can tune in um, or attend the event um, at 4 p.m. on December 19th. Um, so thanks again for joining us, everybody. I hope that um, it was a really educational experience. And Jesse, thanks for sharing everything that you're seeing. And um, we really look forward to following you as your week continues over in Poland. All right. Thank you. Yes. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody.